Okay, so um, I am not Father John, and I say that uh, only half humorously. We've got, um, so Charlotte and I, on a regular basis, receive emails, um, not just from around the country, but from around the world, people who are watching these RCIA Becoming Catholic sessions online through the parish website. Um, we, I think we scored a, uh, an all-time record on Monday. I got an email from a couple um, who are living in Angola. Can anyone tell me where Angola, not Calvin, I know Calvin knows where it's at. <laughs> Angola, yeah, it's in Africa. Yeah, so Angola is in the south of the continent of Africa, just north of South Africa. Um, so I say that only for the uh, people out in YouTube land. Emily, Stephen, good to see you. <laughs> They're the couple in Angola. Um, and I, again, I'm not Father John. I play him on YouTube. <laughs> okay. okay. So tonight um, we are going to, or we have been asked to talk about um, Lent. And we're going to approach this in a particularly Father Ricardo fashion. We're going to talk about it in a number of different ways. We're going to talk about it, in fact, in four ways. Okay? I've got to keep myself here at the podium. This is going to drive John crazy. Um, we're going to try and circle the idea of Lent um, and come at it from a couple of different directions. Um, so that by the time we leave here tonight, uh, hopefully we have a better sense of uh, not just what it is, but what it is we're supposed to be getting out of um, this, uh, this experience. So, we have four goals. Uh, we're going to answer the question, what is it? Where does it come from? Why do we do it? And then Charlotte's going to come in and close us out with some practical uh, suggestions for observing Lent. Okay? It's almost like Jeopardy. So before we get into the particulars, I think it might be a good idea to uh, uh, momentarily reorient ourselves. You know, growing up as a Catholic, um, Lent meant something very specific in my imagination. It was attached to loss, the loss of chocolate, <laughs> dessert, TV, if that's what we were bold enough to uh, embrace as our, uh, our particular penance. Um, you know, the, the words that uh, you see recur throughout um, the season are repentance, penance, penitence. We'll talk about those words and what they mean. Um, and, you know, it's a particularly solemn uh, season in the church calendar, and um, so, you know, it's almost, in my imagination, a kind of spiritual hospice, right? Um, but it's not that. It's supposed to be something very different, and the key to understanding Lent is baptism. There are a couple of reasons why baptism is central to the idea of Lent. First, um, historically, the church has always brought in new people into the communion with the church um, during the Lenten season, in the weeks leading up to Easter Sunday. Uh, so you would receive your uh, sacraments of initiation, beginning with baptism, right? Um, preparation for baptism and for renewing baptismal commitment is at the heart of what we call Lent. Um, and this is particularly true since the 1960s. The Second Vatican Council, again, reoriented the church, um, reemphasizing the baptismal character of Lent, especially through the restoration of the catechumenate and um, the way it observes Lenten rituals. Um, our challenge today is to renew our understanding of this important season of the church year and see how we can integrate it into our personal practices and renewed perspective. Those last two phrases, I think, are really key and they're central to Lent, and they are not at all pejorative or negative in their connotations, right? So it's personal practices and renewed perspective. 
That renewed perspective is as important as anything, I think, to getting at this idea, okay? And remember what baptism is all about. Baptism um, is uh, about um, freeing us from death, from sin, from hell. That's what we are looking toward at the end of Lent, right, with Easter Sunday, what Jesus accomplishes on the cross. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So keep that in mind as we go through tonight, baptism. We'll flesh that out just a little bit more as we go through. Okay? So let's start with Lent. What is it? Well, Lent, as I've said a couple of times now, is a church season, like Advent. Okay? Um, in fact, uh, back in December, you might re remember that Father Ricardo refers to Advent as the little Lent, right? The preparation for Christmas. So church season, and it's specifically the 40 days between Ash Wednesday, which begins next week, right? We'll, we'll celebrate Ash Wednesday on Wednesday, 40 days leading up to Easter Sunday, okay? Let's talk about Ash Wednesday. What is it? Well, it is not a holy day of obligation. And remember, we talked about that before the new year. Um, there are six holy days of obligation in the church. We, you know, celebrate the, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception back in December. Um, January 1st is a holy day of obligation, but Ash Wednesday is not. But we still celebrate Mass on Ash Wednesday. Um, we receive ashes at Mass. We'll talk about that in just a second as a Catholic practice. Last, it is, whoops. It is a day of fasting and abstinence. This is something else we'll get into. We'll define what those things mean and give you some helpful suggestions for that, okay? So why ashes? This was not my idea. This was Chris helping us out here, okay? <laughs> Stephen Colbert, he does this actually. He's, he's a Catholic and um, he'll wear ashes um, on Ash Wednesday when he uh, does his show at night. I've got this one, it's a little more detailed, okay? Um, ashes are applied to the forehead for two reasons, okay? You come into church, um, and when, when do we do this? Do we do this right before communion? Right, okay. After communion? Okay, so it's somewhere right around communion. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, the priests have the option. Okay, so um, there will be, um, we proceed up to the altar, and you will receive one of two, let me get it. The priest will say one of two things as he applies the ashes, okay? Dust to dust you shall return, or turn away from sin and be faithful to the gospel. Um, the ashes are significant um, for two reasons at least, okay? You have one in the first saying as they apply the ashes. It's a, a reminder of our mortality that we are of dust and we will shall return to dust, right? Also, um, it's a reminder that Lent is a season of repentance, okay? And so you have the cross in one sense representing the repentance. You have the ashes themselves, the material representing the idea that we are dust and we will return to dust someday, okay? Let's stop for a second, and uh, th these three words will recur throughout the, uh, the talk tonight. Repentance, penance, and penitence. I think it's important to sort of parse these out as we move through some of these, um, some of the, uh, the catechism uh, support for uh, what we're talking about tonight. So repentance, it's an easy one, okay? Repentance is simply turning away from sin and toward God. Okay, it's the idea that drives Lent, okay? Um, the other two are um, often used interchangeably, but I think it's important to maybe separate them out because they are all related. And in fact, penitence and penance ultimately point us to repentance, okay? So uh, Charlotte and I have four teenage boys at home. Um, things get broken quite a bit. I come home, uh, let's say, from, uh, from work, and there's a broken picture window, okay? And all four boys are home. One of them did it, I'm sure, right? Uh, so um, no one cops to it, but the one who broke it, we can see into his mind, see into his heart, and he is really, really sorry, okay? 
What he is experiencing at that moment is what we call penitence, okay? Penitence, understood one way, is an interior experience of responsibility, an interior sense of um, um, uh, sorry, being sorry for something, okay, on the, in on the inside. Penance is, in some ways, its opposite. Um, so um, I get, uh, I drive up the driveway, there's the broken window, four boys in the house, who did it? The other three rat the perp, you know, the perp out, right? And um, <laughs> so uh, he uh, is grounded uh, and he says, okay, I'll, I'll, I didn't have anything to do this weekend anyway, right? Um, uh, so what he's experiencing in that moment is a, a, a complex of things. <laughs> um, one of which is the external embrace of responsibility. So penance, understood a certain way, is the external, I'm sorry, okay? You need both, right? So the fact that he's telling me, okay, I did it, I'm sorry, it doesn't, doesn't complete the circuit, right? This is part of the social contract that we all participate in. This is also a spiritual concept, right? Penance and penitence are both necessary, not just for a good confession, but for true repentance, okay? So you're gonna see those two Ps equal the R all throughout tonight's presentation. Does that make sense to you, what we just talked about? Literary fans, if you're familiar with The Scarlet Letter, anyone ever read The Scarlet Letter? Okay, so that's what that book is all about, right? Hester Prynne walks around with that scarlet A on her bodice. She's all about penance, but she's not going to take responsibility for what she did. She doesn't want to own that. Dimsdale, spoiler alert, he's the father, right? Um, he walks around and he's torn apart by this, but he won't admit that he's the father, right? So there are two sides of the same coin. True repentance only comes when you embrace penance and penitence. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so that's one way to understand it. Okay. Um, where's Lent come from? Well, we said that baptism is key here. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, jump into scripture here and take a look at how scripture makes the connections between baptism and Lent for us. So I'm going to skip ahead past this Sunday to next Sunday, which would be the first Sunday of Lent. Uh, and I want to take a look at the gospel reading. These things are very intentional. The church does this. Um, it's very clever about how we put together our readings. And so let's go to Luke 4. I want to set the scene here for you. So uh, Jesus has arrived at the River Jordan. He has uh, been baptized uh, by John the Baptist. Uh, we understand baptism in this sense very differently than we understand it in a Catholic sense. So the baptism that uh, John the Baptist is giving at the Jordan River um, has no spiritual implications. It is simply an outward sign of repentance. Um, uh, Jews um, practiced baptism sporadically. Um, other religions before Christianity participated in baptism. Um, so um, Jesus is baptized at the River Jordan for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, uh, as a, a show of solidarity with humanity as he embarks on his ministry. Uh, the other way this is understood is that um, Jewish um, uh, uh, priests would, before entering the temple, uh, would ritually bathe, would cleanse themselves. So in a sense, what Jesus is doing at the River Jordan as he enters into his ministry is reenacting a, kind of, um, a kind of image that uh, folks in the first century would have clearly recognized as echoing what Jewish priests were doing as they entered into the temple. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so we're at that moment. He's been baptized. Next scene. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days being put to the test by the devil. During that time, he ate nothing, and at the end, he was hungry. 
Then the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to turn into a loaf. Jesus replied, Scripture says human beings live not on bread alone. Then leading him to a height, the devil showed him in a moment of time all the kingdoms of the world and said to him, I will give you all this power and this splendor, for it has been handed over to me for me to give to anyone I choose. Do homage then to me, and it shall be yours. But Jesus answered him, Scripture says you must do homage to the Lord God. Him alone you must serve. Then leading to a height, whoops. Then he led him to Jerusalem and set him on the parapet of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said to him, throw yourself down from here. For scripture says, see what he just did? <laughs> Jesus has been answering the devil's temptations with scripture. And so the devil learns. The devil begins to cite scripture as reason, perhaps for motivating him here. As scripture says, he has given his angels orders about you to guard you. And again, they will carry you in their arms in case you trip over a stone. But Jesus answered him, scripture says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Having exhausted every way of putting him to the test, the devil left him until the opportune moment. Okay. So this is the reading from the first Sunday of Lent. Um, and what do we see going on here? Well, we've got the number 40, right? So Jesus goes out into the desert for 40 days. Numbers are important in scripture. Um, it reminds us of numbers that we see in the Old Testament. Remember, Father has talked about this as typology. Types in the Old Testament foreshadow important moments in the New Testament. And we remember the principle that there is nothing ever greater in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. So what are our 40s in the Old Testament? So Noah and the 40 days and 40 nights of water, significant, okay? 40 years in the desert, okay? Moses is up on Sinai for 40 days receiving the Ten Commandments, okay? So let's think about the, um, the connections that we can make between this moment and maybe the Moses. Uh, the 40 day or 40 years wandering in the desert. I think that's the most important connection that we can make here. So look at all the parallels. Uh, this scene begins with a river, begins with Jesus' baptism, and then the 40 days out in the wilderness. How does that connect with what we see in the Moses story? Well, you have the Israelites who are slaves for a little more than 400 years, okay? Any water in that story, right? You have the Red Sea, okay? And remember how this goes down. Father is insistent about how this looks in scripture. You have the Israelites who have been freed. Pharaoh has buyer's remorse, right? He decides that it was a mistake to let those slaves go. So he sends the most powerful army in the world at the time out after the Israelites who have the Red Sea on one side of them and an approaching army on the other. They're grumbling as they want to do. Moses fixes it, right? God parts the Red Sea. The Israelites move through the Red Sea. They get to the other side. And Moses does something very particular. He has the Israelites turn around and watch. And as the Egyptians come through the Red Sea, Moses closes his arms, and that water destroys that army. And it's almost to say, you will never have these things chasing after you, again, literally and figuratively. And in a way, that's exactly what is happening here in Luke. Jesus goes out into the desert as a prelude to his ministry. Those 40 days lead up to Easter Sunday in a very specific way here at Lent. We go three years to the cross on Calvary, and in the same way, Jesus' crucifixion frees slaves, frees us from sin, from death, and hell. 
all of those things are very intentional in the way that these two stories serve as parallels. Does it make sense to you? Okay. Um, so you've got the connections, you've got uh, you know, the, uh, the three temptations. Three is very important uh, in numerology in the scriptures, right? Three is typically associated with the divine. You have the Ten Commandments. The first three commandments are about our relationship with God. The second seven are about our relationship with each other, and that's how it works. Three is symbolic of the divine. Seven is symbolic of humanity seven days of the week, seven deadly sins, right? And when you put them together, you have 10, right? It's a mathematical problem. <laughs> now, 10 represents perfection, right? A perfect 10, okay? All right, so keep that stuff in mind. Okay, so let's go ahead and look to what the catechism has to say about these. Come on, here we go. All right. This kind of spells it out, the connections that we've, uh, we've just tried to make here. The Gospels speak of a time of solitude for Jesus in the desert immediately after his baptism by John. Driven by the Spirit into the desert, Jesus remains there for 40 days without eating. He lives among wild beasts and angels minister to him. And at the end of this time, Satan tempts him three times, seeking to compromise his filial attitude toward God. Jesus rebuffs these attacks, which recapitulate the temptations of Adam in paradise and of Israel in the desert. The devil leaves him, quote, until an opportune time. The evangelists indicate the salvic meaning of this mysterious event. Jesus is the new Adam who remained faithful just where the first Adam had given in to temptation, all right? Jesus is the new Adam. Mary is the new Eve. Remember the wedding of Cana, for example, right? Jesus addresses Mary at the table as woman. That's not a mistake, and it's not disrespectful, right? Woman is the way that Eve is referred to in Genesis. And in all the ways that Eve said no, Mary says yes, even at that wedding, right? The waiters come to her. They ask her for help. She knows who to go to. Jesus' response to her, Wom woman, what does this have to do with me? I'm paraphrasing for the most part, right? What does this have to do with me? And she doesn't respond to him. She speaks past him to the waiters, do what he tells you. <laughs> Good Jewish mother, you're right. No, but in a sense, I mean, think, think for a moment, all that's embodied in that response. You can almost imagine Jesus looking across the table, what does this have to do with me? In other words, do you know what you're asking for? Do you know what this sets in motion? Are you ready for this? And she doesn't respond to him. She responds to the waiters and says, let's go, right? So in the same way, Jesus is doing that here in the desert, um, uh, reconciling himself with the, uh, the, um, the Adam parallel, okay? And we'll go to the next slide here. There's one more after this. Christ reveals himself as God's servant, totally obedient to the divine will out in the desert there. In this, Jesus is the devil's conqueror. He binds the strong man to take back his plunder. Jesus' victory over the tempter in the desert anticipates the victory at the passion, the supreme act of obedience of his filial love for the Father. Jesus' temptation reveals the way in which the Son of God is Messiah, contrary to the way Satan proposes to him and the way men wish to attribute to him. This is why Christ vanquished the tempter for us. For we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sinning. By the solemn 40 days of Lent, the church unites herself each year to the mystery of Jesus in the desert. Okay, And of course, that looks forward to the cross, what the cross accomplishes, and that connection, uh, its connection uh, to baptism. Okay? Um, why we do it, 
okay? I think this is key um, to turning Lent um, from something, at least as a kid uh, for myself, uh, as a sort of, oh, I don't know, um, uh, a, a hold your breath underwater kind of test. Can I make it 40 days without TV? Can I make it 40 days without chocolate, right? Um, these things that we do during Lent have, um, have real purpose, and that's what we want to talk about. So there are two parts to Lent. This can be thought about chronologically. It can be thought about thematically. Okay? Um, in one sense, the first half of Lent, the first three and a half weeks, is all about reflection of the self. Okay? You go inside to take spiritual inventory. There's a reason why we do this. Okay? Second half of Lent, or the second part of Lent, is an intense preparation for the Passion. I'm going to let Father John talk about the Passion and that kind of preparation uh, when he returns. Um, and of course, these two ideas move throughout the entire 40 days. But in a particular way, the first couple of weeks is about taking that kind of spiritual inventory. So let's talk about, for a second, the idea of reflecting on the self. Okay. There are really two questions. Come on. Okay. Um, there are two questions that we ought to be asking ourselves, at least in those early days, those early weeks of Lent. The first is, what does he want us, where does he want us to grow? And number two, what's holding us back? Okay. Um, put another way, what can we put down and what can we pick up? And the way that we discern these two things is to strip it back into clear space, okay? So Lent is all about, again, our orientation to the cross, the suffering, the crucifixion, the resurrection, what those do for us. And as we prepare, we're taking spiritual inventory. And we need a space for this to happen. And the way that we create the space is to strip it back by doing particular things. And this iPad is not helping. First is prayer, fasting, and finally almsgiving. We're going to talk a little bit about these in, um, in detail, okay? But first, I want to go to um, our scripture reading, the gospel uh, for, Wednesday's, for Wednesday's Mass, okay? And that's going to be from the gospel of Matthew. Talk a little bit about this, okay? This is Matthew 6, 1 through um, 16. Jesus said, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whoever gives alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. I don't know how he does this. Okay, there we go. Truly I tell you, they have received the reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that the alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they have been seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And finally, and whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
So two things. Number one, scripture on Ash Wednesday points us to how we prepare throughout Lent. It, it is prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And note that it is not, you know, so when I wrote uh, my gospel, I, I, I had, and if you fast, and if you pray, and if you give alms, that's not how Matthew writes it, right? All of them are when, okay? So there is an expectation that you do these kinds of things. Again, not as punishment, but because by doing things, you clear the space. You make the space to take that spiritual inventory so that you can be prepared to fully embrace, fully comprehend what Easter week means, both in reconnecting us to our baptism and for those of you who are coming into the church, what you are entering into. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so let's go to um, the catechism. We'll uh, wrap this up in short order if I can get the iPad to help. Come on now. Okay. The interior penance of the Christian can be expressed in many and various ways. Scripture and the fathers insist above all on three forms, fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, which express conversion in relation to oneself, to God, and to others. Alongside the radical purification brought about by baptism or martyrdom, they cite as means of obtaining forgiveness of sins, effort at reconciliation with one's neighbor, tears of repentance, there's that repentance word again, um, concern for the salvation of one's neighbor, the intercession of the saints, and the practice of charity which covers a multitude of sins. The seasons and days of penance in the course of the liturgical year, Lent and each Friday in memory of the death of the Lord, are intense moments of the church's penitential practice. And so you see again the word penance, and now we know that's the outward expression of um, remorse, the outward expression of reconciliation. And we see penitential practice there, again, the going inside. These times are particularly appropriate for spiritual exercises, penitential liturgies, pilgrimages as a sign of penance, voluntary self-denial such as fasting and almsgiving, and fraternal sharing, charitable, and missionary works. Okay? So, skipping ahead just a little bit here. Did he put it on here? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving in, um, in the sense of what they actually mean. Okay? Oops. Let's leave that on the ground there. Let's jump to prayer. For those of you who are going on retreat, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about prayer. This is in Father's um, itinerary. But this is what the Catholic Church has to say about prayer itself. Pray constantly, always and for everything, giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. St. Paul adds, pray at all times in the Spirit and with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. For we have not been commanded to work, to keep watch, and to fast constantly, but it has been laid down that we are to pray without ceasing. This tireless fervor can come only from love. Against our dullness and laziness, the battle of prayers is that of the humble, trusting, and persevering love. This love opens our heart to three enlightening and life-giving facts of faith and prayer. And lastly, Prayer and the Christian life are inseparable, for they concern the same love and the same renunciation, proceeding from love, the same filial and loving conformity with the Father's plan of love, the same transforming union in the Holy Spirit who conforms us more and more to Jesus Christ, the same love for all men, the love for which Jesus has loved us. Okay, So as we prepare for Easter, one of the ways that we make space, one of the ways that we take inventory is to make time for prayer. The next thing that we do is we fast. 
And these are the rules for fasting. And again, these are not designed to punish, of course. These are designed to open ourselves up, create the space. So these are the rules that Catholics are asked to abide by. Um, according to Canon 1252 of the Code of Canon Law, all Latin Rite Catholics are required to observe the laws of abstinence starting at the age of 14. And what are we talking about when we talk about the laws of abstinence, especially in the context of Lent? Yeah, meat, okay. Um, Charlotte's going to give us the particulars of um, uh, abstinence uh, during Lent. Um, but the two that we look at are Ash Wednesday and Fridays, okay? Um, there is no upper age limit on abstinence after which the person is automatically excused, but those who need to eat meat for a medical reason may be dispensed from the abstinence requirement. In the United States, fasting requirement begins at 18 and continues into the age of 59. At that age, a person is automatically excused from the requirement to fast on Ash Wednesdays and Good Friday, but if health permits, may participate in the fast should he or she choose to do so. Okay? So those are the rules uh, regarding, uh, or the particulars regarding Lent uh, fasting and abstinence. Let's just jump down one more to almsgiving. Um, this is one um, that uh, not everyone um, automatically gets, but what are we talking about when we're talking about almsgiving? Um, we're talking in particular um, observing um, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy in one sense, right? Um, so not only does it mean to give to the church, uh, to support the church financially, it means um, uh, supporting the poor, um, donating one's time um, in particular ways. We'll talk about that uh, in just a moment here. But PBJ, put a plug in for that. That would be considered almsgiving, right? Come on, got one more. Back down there. And the OLGC homeless shelter. That's another way to think about this. Um, you know, when we're thinking about prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, we know that these are all acts of um, self-discipline. These are acts of charity. These are um, acts of spiritual exercise, if you will. Um, but we offer these gestures up. Um, this is uh, a key component. So you are fasting. It's um, 3 o'clock, and you're really hungry. These are opportunities to offer that up for something or for someone. So keep this intentionality uh, in the back of your mind as we move through these 40 days. Um, what we do, in other words, we need to be doing for someone or something. Um, the last thing I'll say before I turn the microphone over to Charlotte here, keep these pages in order. What we get out of Easter, as the saying goes, is oftentimes what we put into the season of Lent, okay? Um, keep that in the back of your mind, okay? Any questions about any of this? Okay. So I was just going to real quick talk about a couple of um, really simple practical ways um, that you can approach prayer and fasting and almsgiving. Um, Joe already mentioned a couple of them. Um, and it does offer kind of a great opportunity to examine the self um, through some of them and also understanding very deeply um, what the passion was and what Jesus really did for us. Um, in terms of prayer, uh, we're, um, we're really thrilled that um, Father John encouraged us to share what he's going to do, I guess, at least for part of the first two and a half weeks or three and a half weeks that Joe was talking about when you um, examine the self. Um, and we have some handouts over here, um, and it involves 1 Corinthians 13. And there's some reflections um, on the passage um, at the beginning and also at the end. And so you could spend some time in prayer reflecting on 
um, that material that helps you sort of dive deeper into the scripture. Um, and then maybe take um, what each statement for a couple of days or a week of prayer, depending on um, what is useful for you. So um, looking at love is patient, um, thinking today, was I patient? And if I wasn't patient, um, what did, you know, how can I make up for that? Um, so if you each take a handout um, and walk through that, that's something that you could do through prayer, uh, uh, particularly during that first half of Lent. Um, we also often have the Magnificat um, upstairs, and there's a Lent version, um, and that can sort of take you through um, days of prayer um, to do during the Lent season. Um, adoration is a great way to dive into prayer. Um, we'll get into that a little bit on the retreat. Um, but we have the Adoration Chapel upstairs, and I think many of you have already gotten involved in that. Um, when you're in Adoration, I know Father John often says, um, waste some time with God. And I have my own sort of thoughts on what that means, um, which is to sort of be quiet. Um, I've been praying all my life, um, long before I came a Catholic, and uh, constantly I'm in the car. Um, and I realized when I was on retreat that I never listened. Um, and I never heard God speak to me because I was always talking. Um, and so in adoration, um, I learned to be quiet. And it was a really incredible experience. So I encourage people to um, really try to use some self-discipline to just sit and listen. Um, another thing is the rosary. So um, if you haven't learned how to pray the rosary, like I said, I've been praying all my life, but I'm, I'm kind of that conversational prayer. You know, this is what happened today, and I really need help with this, and oh my gosh. And um, So it was actually it kind of took my prayer in a whole new direction when I started trying to learn some of the more formal prayers. Um, and it helps you sort of um, open your heart and your mind to the Holy Spirit in a different way. Um, so there are others, um, but the rosary is one to a really great one to start with. And there are prayer cards you can get that, or you can also Google it online to sort of walk through that. Um, we also often have the rosary going on. Um, we'll have it at retreat um, and here at the church so you can um, participate with a group to learn it. Um, and then there are prayer ministries. And I know everyone hears this when they're at Mass, um, but you can uh, go to the back of the church or at different times and um, have people pray over, pray over you. Um, we often have this at the retreat as well. Um, this is an experience that was intimidating to me at first because I wasn't sure going into it what I had to do. Um, but those who are involved with the prayer ministry, I think Karen prayed over me when I was on retreat. Um, they, they know what they're doing, so you can just walk up and, and they'll help you get through it. And it's um, a really, really amazing feeling to have people right there with you praying on what you need prayed for at the time, even if you don't know what that is. Um, there's good prayers for that. 